Hello and welcome to lesson two on your language investigation. It's Mr. Bell here again. You will now have thought about some ideas for your investigation. You might not have honed it down to a specific one yet, but you'll have a couple of areas of choice. So today we're going to work on that. Now I asked you to read the spec pages and it comes it brings across an awful lot of obscure language choices in the spec pages. Number one, it says for approaches to investigation, a genre based investigation. Now, this is what most people do. They look at a particular topic area. So they might look at the language of political speakers. They might look at the language of hairdressers. They might look at a particular genre area. A functional use based investigation. What's the language used to do? Well, the two of these overlap really, don't they? So if you're looking at the language of a political speech, you're also looking at the language of persuasion. So I wouldn't worry too much about whether you're doing a genre based one or a function based one, because effectively you're going to be using, you're going to be doing both of these. Now, the third one of these, an attitudes based investigation, that's going to require an awful lot of kind of survey type stuff. We haven't had many students do these over the years. I don't think I've had one in the last three or four years. If there's a particular attitude you want to investigate, we will help you with this, but we don't really recommend it because we are, we're just less experienced with it and also because we might not have as much one-to-one -one time as we'd like to help you with that. The fourth one, a user-based investigation, who uses this type of language. Well, that could be from some kind of um, some forum type thing or something like that. But again, it's not something we're very really expert in. We tend to focus on topic area one and two, picking a topic and thinking also about why, uh, what is the language within that topic area used to do. So hopefully that clarifies that a little bit. Choose your topic, really, your genre. Now, types of data collection. You will need to choose from one of these types of things. Um, spoken language, most people do use spoken language. Most people get transcripts of things. Often that will be literally going into, a, into an institution, a building, a school, um, a meeting room and recording a conversation on a phone and then transcribing it. There will be a how to transcribe sheet coming with this as well. That's the most common thing. Equally common is written is spoken language, which has been taken off YouTube or recorded from DVDs and things like that. And that's also fine. We do recommend, though, for spoken language that you transcribe it yourselves because previous transcripts are a little bit unreliable. Written language. Um, I will show you an example of a written language one in a later lesson where someone actually looked at um, the language of women's rights campaigns over time and looked purely at the posters that were used. So that was based on written language, but most people tend to focus on spoken language. We've had a few on multimodal language, ones which look at things such as internet chat rooms, and your data could come from those because it, it features aspects of both written language and spoken language, making it multimodal language. Number four, I haven't had a words list based investigation for a very, very long time. We really do recommend this as an approach if you could actually get your access to some corpus materials. This can be a really effective approach to an investigation. But um, I'm not going to make a specific video on that. If it's something you'd like to do, a corpus which you can identify lists of words under similar topics are words collocated. So for example, if you put into a corpus search the word woman, you would see what words are used in connection with woman. You can do this over time and it brings out fascinating results. Five, six and seven, attitudes, uses and views of language. We don't really recommend these because we haven't had very much done on them in the past. And also because if you're focusing on attitudes to language, how are you going to be really good with your linguistic analysis? How are you going to hit high marks for AO1 for your terminology? Probably not. So spoken, written, multimodal, or words lists. Most people do spoken language. I'm not trying to persuade, dissuade you from doing it because most people do it. Most people do it because it's good and it works really well. Okay, I'm going to give you now nine examples of data and I want you to rank them thinking about how challenging would it be to collect this data. Actually, before you start thinking about how challenging it would be, 
think about how interesting the data would be for language. So you can see the language of the TV sitcom Friends, the language of myself or Mrs. Lilly teaching different year 10 classes, the language, the inaugural addresses of three American presidents, Bill Clinton, George Bush Jr. and Barack Obama, names of bars in Whitley Bay, language of the Sun newspaper, developing language of anti-smoking campaigns, language of a group of friends, the language of the character of Dr. Jekyll, the language of hairdressers. Okay, could you rank those now, please? Take a few minutes and write down, please, which ones you think would be most to least interesting in terms of investigations. When you're done, press the video again. Press play. Okay, you've ranked these in terms of how interesting they are. I want you to add a second ranking to them now. We're thinking about data collection. How are you going to get the data for your investigation? How are you going to get transcripts? How are you going to get copies of things? I want you to rank them now. Easiest to most difficult, please. The easiest to the most difficult in terms of actually collecting the data. Which ones would take you five minutes? Which ones might take you a week? Right there, uh, record your answers, please. And then I will feed back and I will give you answers to this one. Okay, easy to difficult. I'm going to start with the easiest one, and the easiest one of these by a mile might surprise you. But it is. This one. The inaugural addresses of three American presidents, Bill Clinton, George Bush Jr. and Barack Obama. And I'm going to show you how easy it would be to collect this data. Here's my Google search. Look, I've put in George W. Bush in. I haven't even written the full word. And then I can bring it up there and I can scroll down to inauguration speech here. I click on that. It brings this up. I click that link there. And it takes me to the full transcript. I copy that transcript out. I paste it into a Word, a word document. I make another Word document, another Word document, all of the same things. And voila, I've got all my stuff. The reason I'm making three Word documents, I want one clean one that I'm going to keep and never write on. And I want at least one that I'm going to annotate. But let's go back a bit. If you can see where I clicked on the purple bit here, there are also YouTube videos here of George W. Bush's inaugural address. Be careful. He had a father. George H. W. Bush, who was also president, made an address. That would be the wrong one. But if I clicked on either of these, I would get him actually delivering the address, him saying it. And then I could transcribe it, and that would be better and would take much longer. So some things might seem tricky, but they're actually really easy to find. Key thing to remember again, you're going to want quite a few copies of your data. So I'll summarise, easy to data, easy to difficult for data collection. The president's speeches is number one, it's the easiest. The language of the character of Henry Jekyll, easy too. I could get that from a Google search in about half an hour. The language of Mr. Bell and Mrs. Liddy teaching different year 10 lessons. Well, let's forget the current context, shall we? This would be fairly easy to get. I would pop into the same point of a lesson, either the beginning or the end or the middle of a lesson for each teacher to keep it fair. It has to be fair. We have to reduce variables. I would go in with my phone and I would record that lesson, take it away and transcribe it. Challenges, I'd have to make uh, appointments with them, wouldn't I? Real challenge now, Mrs. Lilly isn't going to be here. A further challenge on this, um, we probably might not even have year 10 lessons. Nobody knows what's going on, do we? Language of the TV sitcom Friends, it's getting trickier now. There's too much in this, isn't there? What are you going to focus on? This is too broad, so it needs real narrowing down for collection. Names of bars in Whitley Bay. It has changed so much over the last 10 years. South Parade has more or less died out. That bastion of the uh, bank holiday scene has gone. How would you find out which bars are there? A Google search? Maybe, but that's not even entirely up to date on Google Maps. Yellow Pages? Probably out of date. So it's actually quite tricky. The best way to do this is to hop on a bike and cycle around the whole place and find them, and find them all. Language of the Sun newspaper. Well, I've got to go and buy a copy for starters or through a paywall. I'll have to pay for it online. Secondly, my hands would start burning with the evilness of having this absolute filth rag in it because it's disgusting. Do not read it. Third reasons. Well, it's far too broad again, like the Friends one. What am I focusing on? Am I focusing on editorials? Am I focusing on sports stories? Front pages? It's difficult, isn't it? It's too broad. 
language of a group of friends. This is quite tricky. You get, you're not allowed to record anyone without their permission, so you have to get permission from your friends. If you get permission from your friends, they'll start behaving differently. It's what's called the observer's paradox. When people know they're being observed, they behave in different ways, so you can never get a true observation of them. Interesting, isn't it? What you could do, though, is set up a scenario um, where you tell them you're going to record them, but you don't say when. Now, you might not even be able to get close to your friends for quite some time. This could happen through Zoom or something like that, or any FaceTime conversations you're doing. But I think this is probably a no in the current climate. Developing language of anti-smoking campaigns. Um, it's, it's hard to know, it's hard to find them. And I also found when I did Google searches into this, you'll find one that's clearly old. But was it 1930s or 1950s? Are some, it's sometimes really hard to find an actual date for when these things are from. The language of hairdressers. Well, let's imagine hairdressers were open. If they were open, you've got a couple of problems here. You've got to get permission from the hairdresser. You've got to get permission from the client whose hair is being cut. And you've got to record it, despite the fact there's blow dryers going on everywhere. So the contextual factors you've got to think about with this are massive. My advice, in the current situation that we're in, find something already existing online and record from that. So how interesting then, how successful language of the Sun newspaper? Well, the Sun newspaper prides itself on low levels of language on a low reading age. Don't know if you get much interesting from it. The president's ones is absolutely fine. It can make a good investigation. I've just had loads of it. So I'm not that, I'm personally not that interested. Doesn't mean I would be a negative or prejudiced against you. Um, Dr. Jekyll or Lenny from Mice and Men, I forgot to change that. I'm not interested in literature ones because there's too many contextual things. That's a lit study, not a language study. Names of bars and Whitley Bay are fascinating now that's changed. I would quite like that one. Language of the TV sitcom Friends, if you could zone in on one particular area, the language of Ross in Friends. Language and embarrassment, the character of Ross in Friends, that'd be great. Development language of anti smoking campaigns, this could be really interesting. Smoking used to be advertised as something that was good for you, good for your mental health particularly. I'm always interested in ones about uh, about teachers, not particularly interested in myself, but it's going to be hard to get your data. Groups of friends, it's fascinating. But I think I really like the language and occupations, languages specific occupations, and I haven't had one on hairdressers yet, so I'd be really interested in that. So, your independent work for this week is to start collecting your data. Decide what you want to investigate and start collecting it. I have four tips for you. Have manageable amounts. Don't try and collect too much data. Transcriptions of up to 10 minutes will be absolutely fine. You don't really want to go beyond that. You want fair and unbiased data. We'll look in a few lessons time at someone who did an investigation into police stop and searches. This investigation is clearly very biased. It's very, very good too, but I did think it was very biased against the police, which kind of slightly weakened the investigation a little bit. Third one, control your variables. If you're going to be doing um, the opening of one TV episode, if you're looking at a TV programme and you look at the opening of one episode, you can't look at the ending to the next one. You can't compare openings and endings to something. It would have to be openings and openings, middles and middles, endings and endings, whatever you do. So try and control your variables. Talk to us about that if you think you're maybe getting your variables wrong. You're thinking variables, that's a bit sciencey. Well, yeah, it is. We need you to think like a scientist for this. And the fourth one, data that's linguistically interesting that you listen to or you read and think, oh, this is interesting. Even if you don't know exactly what it is that interests you yet or exactly what's going on in the language, you have teachers who are highly experienced and highly skilled at helping you with this, we will help you with that. But there are four tips. Something you're interested in, manageable amounts of it, fair and unbiased, keep your variables under control, and choose something linguistically interesting. Okay, that's everything for lesson two. We'll see you later. Good luck collecting your data. We're going to give you a few lessons to do this. Bye-bye.